will arise with the UK from Euratom. Oh geez, just a glitch here. Uh, just some background first. I'm currently a senior solicitor with Glacier Solicitors LLP in Manchester. I spend the majority of my time these days working on property development matters. I do, however, have considerable experience in nuclear law, having previously been uh, head of legal at the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority and a legal director advising on nuclear at Adelshaw Goddard. As well as being a member of the Nuclear Institute, I am also a member of the International Nuclear Law Association, where I am a director of the UK branch and of the Nuclear Liability Subgroup of the Nuclear Industries Association. Right, we'll move on to the first uh, topic, which is on nuclear liability. As a member of that uh, liability subgroup I just mentioned, I've actually been working on this on and off for more than 10 years, unbelievably. And just moving on to where we were, the law surrounding nuclear liability seeks to cover the damage to third parties which would ensue following a nuclear incident. That is damage off the license site, not on the nuclear license site. Generally, strict liability is placed upon the operator of the nuclear site. In the UK, this of course means the holder of the nuclear site license. So how did this come about? There are a number of international conventions covering the principles of nuclear liability. The UK is a member of the Paris and Brussels conventions. The general principles of those conventions are, and there are six really, strict liability of the operator, channeling of liability to the operator, limitation of liability in time and amount, compulsory financial security, jurisdiction, and applicable law and non-discrimination of victims. And we're going to look at these in a little more detail in due course. So how does that translate into UK nuclear law in the UK? It's actually in the Nuclear Installations Act 1965, which is based on the Paris and Brussels conventions, although it is, as ever in the UK, a slightly more complex than it really needs to be. Broadly, the Nuclear Installations Act provides that the operator of the nuclear installation is strictly liable for nuclear damage caused to third parties by a nuclear incident emanating from the installation. This is regardless of whether the operator is at fault. The operator is currently liable for personal injury and property damage, but this is capped and limited in time. Operators must have insurance or other financial security in place to cover potential liability. Now the Paris and Brussels conventions were amended by a protocol in 2004. The effect of this protocol is broadly as follows. An increased cap on operator liability. This currently stands under the Nuclear Installations Act at 140 million pounds. It's going to be increased in installments to 1.2 billion euros. Um, I'll go into this in more detail in due course. Wider geographical scope. The regime, regime is now going to encompass non-Paris Convention countries. An extension of the limitation period from 10 years to 30 years to bring a claim for personal injury. Uh, changes in insurance, so given the increased limitation period, the government may have to provide insurance itself on commercial terms in case insurance is not available from the market. New heads of damage, these are very quickly, and again I'll go into these in more detail, the cost of measures of reinstatement of impaired environment, the loss of income deriving from a direct economic interest in any use or enjoyment of the environment, 
the costs of preventative measures and further loss or damage caused by such measures. There are also also nuclear substances where lower limits may be set for certain types of installation and in respect to jurisdiction the courts of only one country will deal with claims arising from a nuclear incident. So just moving on, this new regime will require nuclear operators to have insurance in place for a much greater amount which will mean that supply chain contracts will need to take account of the changes. The changes are going to be implemented into UK law under the Nuclear Installations Liability for Damage Order 2016, which from now on I'll call the order. The majority of the order will come into force on the day in which the 2004 protocol comes into force for the UK. This will only happen when all countries have ratified. There are actually 15 countries in Paris Convention world so we're still waiting for ratification but it's currently expected that the changes will come into force in the middle of next year this has been going this date has been going forwards for a number of years so i wouldn't take that as gospel some procedural provisions of the order are already in force uh, to allow the government to take the necessary steps towards ratification there are also some other particular areas in force regarding accepted matter. So let's now have a, a detailed look at the uh, some of the changes. First of all, looking at the new categories of damage, these give rise to greater scope for channeling of liability to operators. For the first two categories, that is regarding the what you might call broadly the environmental issues the environmental impairment has to be of such a degree that it would be eligible for compensation as property damage this means there needs to be some alteration in the physical characteristics of the property affected by the nuclear incident which render it less useful or valuable that comes from the decision in the blue circle case of quite a number of years ago now um, where there was damage to blue circles property by emissions from uh, the atomic weapons establishment so that's broadly we don't really know exactly how we're going to apply but that's broadly some of the consequences turning now to the increase in caps on liability for power plants and standard nuclear sites, the initial increase is from 140 million pounds to 700 million euros. This will be raised by a further 100 million euros annually until it reaches the 1.2 billion euros threshold I mentioned previously. In fact, the protocol only requires a raise to 700 million euros but the UK government has chosen to impose a higher limit for intermediate sites and I'll come on to what they are in a little while the increase is from 140 million pounds to 160 million euros not a great deal of difference there for low risk sites which I'll also come into in a little while the increases from 10 million pounds to 70 million euros more substantial increase and for low risk transport it's 10 million pounds to 80 million euros now the intermediate sites include those for fuel fabrication uranium enrichment and the manufacture of radioactive isotopes for non-nuclear purposes so examples in the uk would be say Springfields or Capenhurst uh, low risk transport is going to be decided in accordance with the International Atomic Energy Agency regulations for the safe transport of radioactive materials low risk sites are likely to be those uh, for the uh, storage and disposal of low level radioactive waste for example the low level waste repository at Drig in Cumbria 
Where a lower level of liability has been prescribed, public funds must be available to top up the level of compensation. Now, going now to the extensive geographical scope, under the current Paris Convention regime, the Neutral Institutions Act, this only applies in Paris Convention countries. So claimants from non-convention countries cannot seek compensation, but nor are they bound by the restriction and caps. So could sue either operators or non-operators in their own courts with greater exposure for both operators and non-operators. The scope is now increased to encompass all qualifying territories, which will include all non-nuclear countries and countries that have reciprocal liability arrangements. For example, some of you will know that there is an alternative to the Paris Convention, the Vienna Convention, and it will cover, the scope is now extends to Vienna Convention countries essentially. So just taking a broad example, Anyone suffering damage in Ireland, which is both non-nuclear and non-convention, will now be able to make a claim in the UK courts as well as in the Irish courts once the changes have come into force. They're actually more likely to make the claim in the UK courts because it will be more straightforward, although amounts above the cap could be claimed in an Irish court. The expansion does not apply to the Brussels Convention, which deals with the showing of government liability for claims above the cap. And then one point on nuclear incidents. There was an area of uncertainty for the Nuclear Installations Act 1965, which of course still currently applies, although it will not when the new provisions come in. It will then be clear that only operators who contribute to a lease leading to an incident will be liable. Previously, there was a potential new scope of liability each time that nuclear matter was disturbed and moved to a new place. And this came out of the Magnahard case, which some of you may have heard of, which involved the release of particles from Dune Ray arriving on Sandside Beach to the west, and each arrival was deemed by the courts to be a new nuclear incident. That will be avoided once the changes have come in. <coughs> Excuse me. Just one final point to mention on nuclear liability, which is potential difficulty with the Nuclear Installations Act 1965. This isn't connected with the changes. But it is of particular concern to the supply chain. Excuse me, I'm just going to take a quick drink. That's better. <clears throat> I suspect that many of you are involved in the supply chain. Now, Clause 12.3a of the Nuclear Installations Act provides that a third party can be liable to an operator where there is an agreement between their liability entered into in writing before the occurrence of the incident in question. So this could mean that the operator could offset some of the liability by suing the supplier, <coughs> excuse me again, if uh, the incident was caused partly or wholly by a defect, say, in the uh, supplier's equipment on site. Many standard contracts used in the industry make the supplier responsible for any losses or damage suffered by the employer arising from a breach of contract. This could certainly be extended to damage caused by a nuclear incident. So I think the, the point to take away from this is that you should always take care to exclude the operation of Section 12.3a uh, from your contracts in the supply chain. And this obviously will become more important, important when the order comes into force as the potential for liability will be greater. So that's the first aspect we've looked at. I'm now going to move on to withdrawal from Euratom. As I'm sure we all know, the outcome of the UK referendum on withdrawal from the EU resulted in the government confirming that it was withdrawing from Euratom as well. 
this is going to take place as we know at the end of March 2019 unless an extension or transitional arrangement is agreed. Personally, I don't believe it was necessary to withdraw from Euratom as a result of the Brexit vote, but it has happened and the government and industry, of course, have to deal with the consequences. So let's have a brief look first at what Euratom actually is. The UK joined Euratom in 1973 at the same time as it joined what was then known as the EEC. The Euratom Treaty essentially sets out eight areas of activity. Promotion of research, establishing and policing uniform safety standards, facilitating investment, ensuring a regular supply of ores and fuels, safeguards, rights of ownership over special fissile materials, and the creation of a nuclear common market. And establishing relations with other countries and international organizations to foster the progress in nuclear energy. Now the withdrawal from Euratom risked disruption of international nuclear cooperation and trade. In particular, the provision of resources and know-how to the waste and decommissioning sectors, the new build program, and the international movement of radioactive waste. Safeguards and international relations in the form of nuclear cooperation agreements are likely to be of most concern, and I will talk more about these areas in a few minutes' time. First, I want to bring you up to date on the state of negotiations. As I understand it, all parties have now agreed principles for addressing the key separation issues. This includes agreement that the UK will be responsible for international nuclear safeguards in the UK and will introduce a regime that is effective as current Euratom arrangements and the principles of ownership of special fissile materials and responsibility for spent fuel and radioactive waste. Now this of course leaves plenty of scope for clarification and development. It appears that the government's aim is to remain as close as possible to existing arrangements, achieving as much continuity as possible without actually remaining as a full member of Euratom. There is no model as such, I think we all know that, so a bespoke solution is required. There may even be a solution which recognizes an ongoing jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, a pr pragmatic solution if ever there was one. So just a quick word about transitional periods. A transitional period during which current arrangements for implementing safeguards within the UK would alleviate time pressure on establishing a domestic safeguarding regime. This would be of immense help to the Office of Nuclear Regulation who are tasked with establishing this regime. As for cooperation agreements, the UK is only likely to retain the benefit of them while it is a full member of Euratom. It is unlikely that Euratom could extend the benefits of such agreements on a unilateral basis during a transitional period. So turning now to the two specific areas, we're going to look first at safeguards. Safeguards are essential to the nuclear industry worldwide. They, this essentially means verifying that nuclear material is where it should be and is used only for its intended purpose. International safeguards are administered by the International Atomic Energy Agency under the Non-Proliferation Treaty which requires that non-nuclear weapon states accept comprehensive safeguards on all nuclear material. Similar arrangements are in place for, for nuclear weapons, of which UK is of course one. Safeguarding requirements applicable to the UK therefore arise from both IAEA and Euratom. The latter requirements go beyond those of IAEA both in relation to quantities of material and nuclear facilities requiring inspection. Currently, the UK satisfies its safeguarding operation through Euratom. 
So there is now going to have to be and will be a new domestic safeguards regime to be run by the Office of Nuclear Regulation. This is intended to deliver to Euratom standards and exceed the standards set by IAEA. It may have been tempting to reduce the obligation to obtain a commercial advantage, but the government has not chosen to take that route. There is a safeguards bill currently before Parliament as a contingency arrangement to be used if an appropriate future relationship with Euratom cannot be established. The bill currently only provides enabling powers for development of a domestic regime. It does not yet have detailed regulations repl replicating current Euratom requirements. Of course, a system of accounting and control to meet those requirements will also have to be developed and delivered. This is likely to cause resource difficulties within ONR. ONR is confident of meeting IAEA obligations by the end of March next year, but additional time is likely to be required to include all the activities necessary for a robust and comprehensive assurance regime. Thankfully, it would be possible during a transition period for the UK to continue to rely on Euratom inspections and monitoring but the safeguarding regime would have to be set out in UK law in place of the current Euratom regulation. Now moving on to the second area, which is regarding cooperation agreements. Nuclear trade between the UK and other members of Euratom relies on cooperation provisions within the Euratom Treaty and common Euratom safeguarding arrangements. Nuclear trade with other countries is similar although some trade relies on separate cooperation agreements. However, the majority of these have been made in the assumption of continued UK participation in the Euratom safeguards. So there may be a small problem. If the UK is unable to demonstrate adequate safeguards and replacement cooperation agreements, then some countries will have to cease trade with the UK in nuclear materials, components, technology, and know-how. This, for example, could affect the supply of key components of both the Itachi GEA BWR, which is going to be used by Horizon, and the Westinghouse AP1000, which is proposed to be used by NewGen, and could also disrupt supplies to Sellafield. An absence of an agreement with Australia could cut off a key source of uranium ore. So the government, not unexpectedly, has identified development of new agreements with USA, Canada, Australia and Japan as key milestones within the program for the Euratom. And in respect of Sellafield, it's also added Kazakhstan and China in respect for key components. Further problem, though, is the establishment of a new safeguarding regime will be a condition of finalizing any new agreements. The acceptability of the regime will be a matter for each counterparty. For those countries which require this, it may be challenging to meet the timetable. For instance, a new section one, two, three agreement, which is a cooperation agreement with the USA, will have to undergo a 90-day congressional review period, which would mean that the new safeguarding regime would have to be established by the end of this year. Right, thank you all. That's uh, my brief overview of current developments of nuclear law. I think it's fair to say, to sum up, there are challenging times ahead. And from here, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Roger. Um, so, um, yeah, as, as, um, as Roger said, you can um, now ask um, some questions if you would like to. Um, it's on the, um, the drop-down box um, titled Questions, um, or you can type them into the chat and um, I will read those out for you.
Okay, uh, so we've got a question through um, from Siddharth Sinha, and um, he is wanting to know um, what about regulations and laws for advanced nuclear reactor technologies like SMRs? There are no specific uh, laws to cover those areas at the moment. Okay. I think that's a simple <laughs> question. <laughs> Okay. Uh, we've got a question from Jamie McDonald. Uh, for potential claims where both operator and claimant are in the UK, is it possible to bring a claim under common law, for example, nuisance, nuance, uh, as an alternative to NIA 1965? And if so, would there be any advantage in doing so? Uh, yes, it is possible to, to bring it. There are essentially four torts under which you could bring a claim. Um, I think you're looking at nuisance, negligence, Ryan's and Fletcher are potentially even trespass. But the, the disadvantage is, of course, you have to go through all the loopholes or, 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 sorry, all the steps to establish damage uh, in tort for an um, obviously foreseeability, uh, measures of damages, you don't have the strict liability that bringing a claim under the NIA gives you. Okay, thank you. Any final questions at all? Uh, I've got one through from um, Tom Cullinan. Um, would a new bespoke customs union with the EU provide an adequate solution to the challenges posed by Brexit? Uh, I, I don't think it will because it's specifically uh, related to Euratom uh, and as far as I'm aware the government has not made any announcement that they are withdrawing from their proposed withdrawal from Euratom. It's, uh, the uh, customs union and Euratom are two entirely different uh, concepts. Okay, um, I think we'll um, end the questions there, um, but um, Roger has uh, said that he's happy to take any uh, further questions by email, um, so um, feel free to do that. Um, I will distribute his um, email address uh, following the presentation, um, but um, that's, that's great. Thank you so much, everybody, um, for listening in today, and um, I hope you enjoyed yourself, and um, thanks so much, Roger, for presenting. Thank you very much to all of you for listening. Thank you. Bye. Bye.